Welcome, everyone. So welcome to today's What's New in Addiction Social Work Lecture, presented today by E.J. Link. I am Jessica, Jessica Mensinger, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Addiction Social Work Fellowship Program. I'm joined here by my colleague, Zan Rothenberg, and I'm very honored to be calling in from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shaquetan Nation, and really want to acknowledge all the nations on which you're all calling in from today. EJ is a current fellow of the Addiction Social Work Fellowship Program, and will be doing an introduction for himself as a part of his lecture, so I will not do it for him today. Um, but we do want to note that Zan and I will be here to support and we'll be monitoring the chat for questions and we'll have room at the end for those. So please do feel free to add questions throughout the presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to EJ and welcome him to his lecture. Wonderful. Thanks, Jess. And uh, thanks, Zan and Amir for helping me out in the background. Um, my conversation today is going to be around substance use care and access for Indigenous populations. Uh, and to preface this, uh, I'm going to be using the term Indigenous to uh, encompass First Nations, Inuit, and, and Métis peoples. Uh, and the term Aboriginal is also interchangeable in this context. And I will have a couple of slides that do use Aboriginal instead of uh, Indigenous. And this is just to try and respect and honour um, each group of Indigenous peoples, just so that um, all of them are respected as, as we go through this discussion. So I am presenting to you on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations uh, in what is known now as Vancouver. And I also want to take a second here to recognize the impacts of the war on drugs, and that's including criminalization, institutionalization and disproportionately harming and discriminating against people who use drugs. And there are current and ongoing harms of Indigenous Black and people of color just because of the racist and capitalist underpinnings of this war. To further my land acknowledgement, I want to be able to share with you four of the 94 calls to action that I believe within the realm of, of substance use, we can continue and strengthen being allies for Indigenous peoples by keeping this mind as in mind as I go through this conversation. 19 being establishing measurable goals, to identify gaps, and try and close them in health outcomes when it comes to talking about Aboriginal peoples and non-Aboriginal communities. Number 20, calling upon the government to recognize respect, and address the distinct health needs of off-reserve Aboriginal people. 21, providing sustainable funding for existing and creation of new Aboriginal healing centers. And 22, to recognize the value of Aboriginal healers and their ways of, of healing and knowledge when it comes to being able to provide healing practices. Now, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose, but however, I do feel it's important to disclose that I am Indigenous, and this topic hits quite close to home for me. Within my role outside of the fellowship, I also work as a counselor for Indigenous populations across the province, and every day I hear stories of lots of people who are impacted by the toxic drug supply and the substance use concerns that they have within their local communities. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize about this topic is how, how we're going to do this today is just outlining an introduction of who I am. We're going to go over some learning objectives about what this conversation is going to be about. I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in our world current day over the last year or so. And then we're going to talk about bed-based treatments and its availability across the province and how Indigenous addiction services options are. I'm gonna talk a little bit about land-based healing, two-eyed seeing, and what this means for social work as we continue to look forward. So an honorable introduction is something that I've been taught that is important to start with. It allows you to acknowledge and understand who I am, where I come from, where my family comes from, what roles I've been and why I'm here that you can figure out 
how we may we may be able to align a relationship. Indigenous culture is inspired by connection and relationship. And to walk in good relations is to start getting to know who you're speaking with. So again, for those who have not met me, my name is EJ Link. And for those who I have had the opportunity to meet, I really appreciate you being here to listen and talk today. I'm a son, brother, nephew, cousin, uncle, partner, and a friend. And I come from a blended family where I've been able to have the privilege to walk in multiple worlds. Uh, as you can see on these pictures here, um, on the top left are my parents, on the right side are my siblings. And I just want to honor them because my dad, Ernie Link, is from the Statlium Nation of the Hawklet Band just outside of Lillooet. And my mother, Tassiana Saisaya Kilai, is Filipino from the Laguna province of the Philippines. I unfortunately never really got a chance to know my grandparents on either side. Um, and with that, my grandmother, Effie Ned, um, I was told that she was a survivor of St. Mary's Residential School that closed down recently in 1984. She didn't talk about being Indigenous, so I never really knew what that meant. I grew up around the Stolo territory, surrounded by Chiam, Chehalis, and Seabird Island bands in a small town called Agassiz, picking up bits and pieces of their culture, not really knowing what it was like to be fully connected to mine. I went on to post-secondary in the Silks territory in Kelowna, where I got an undergrad degree in microbiology and psychology, and MSW, Masters of Social Work, where I really got a chance to learn about what was taken away from me before I even got a chance to even receive that. And so now I'd love to try and talk to you about my limited expertise on something that has impacted me quite significantly and those around us. So some of the day, uh, objectives that I want to talk about today is to recognize the difference between Indigenous and non-Indigenous access to substance use services in those sorts of facilities, to gain an understanding of the availability of Indigenous-specific and influenced substance use services, to provide information on land-based treatment and how it can work in collaboration with Western treatments, and some of the implications that come along with social work. So to start things off, I want to share with you some of the news articles that strike my mind when we talk about supporting these people in the world of substance use. And the first thing that I really want to share is this report called In Plain Sight. This document was published in 2020. And it shared the impacts of the, in the Indigenous people's experience going through healthcare systems when they are seeking services. Some of these discussions that were had, Indigenous people sh openly shared, was that there was a widespread amount of racism, discrimination, um, and just conversations that weren't necessary, like asking if they are drunk or ask about substance abuse. If there was a child involved, they automatically assumed that they were bad parents because of the child child care system, and. Honestly, they never got respect and courtesy and were never a part of care decisions. This report highlights the discrimination at the point of care, negatively affecting access to care, and negative, uh, negative experiences within healthcare leading to poorer outcomes. And this is just basic healthcare. I can't even begin to encapsulate the complexity of what that trickle-down effect means to substance use and addictions world. Other news articles outside of Plain Sight is such as this one, um, First Nation women represented among BC toxic drug deaths. First Nation members representing 16.4% of the population, and that equates to about six times the rate of dying to toxic drug supply compared to the overall population. First Nations in BC, this community in the Northwest region of, of Vancouver Island, talking about a, a state of emergency where the impacts on youth and young adults have happened so significantly that there was nothing else to do but 
to declare a state of emergency just to get some attention from the government after conversations. These are some of the headlines that I can tell you that I've lived around. I've been experiencing them through work and through personal lives. As we discuss this further, I want to be able to share with you the trend about the general population and how that compares to Indigenous peoples. This table here is from the BC Coroner's uh, Services, and it shows the numbers of the unregulated, unregulated drug deaths by health authority and in the province at the very bottom. With these numbers from last year, you can calculate that approximately seven people are gonna to die today of drug poisoning alone. Out of 2,511, two that'd be seven people today. Highlighting in the red box over the last four years, how quickly this has increased. You can see that over time it's been consistent, but over the last four years, it has been alarming at which the numbers are going up. Using 2020 as an anchor, you can see that from 2020 to 2023, there's been a 41% increase in deaths over the last four years alone. To compare that with Indigenous peoples in the province, this is something that came up from FNHA, and they only have the reports for the first six months of last year. I'm guessing it's going to be another few months before they get the full year's data. But I want to bring your attention to this box here in the red. Indigenous people make up 3.4% of the provincial population. They accounted for 17.7% of the toxic drug deaths. Indigenous women nearly died at 12 times the rate of others. Men at 4.6%. In the first six months of 2023, we we're nearly a 25% increase of the year prior to that alone. Now, over the years that I highlighted in the previous table, this is what I was able to collect from FNHA. Over the last several years, you can see the rate of deaths increasing right in the, in the numbers in the parentheses at the bottom. As you can see in 2020, Indigenous peoples made up 14.7% of people who died of drugs. In the first six months of 2023, yet 17.7% in the first half. If we were to estimate that and continue on that trend, 2023 approximately had 440 deaths of Indigenous peoples across the province. That means the seven people that were likely to die today of overdose, two of those would be Indigenous. To use the anchor of 2020, estimating the trend with 440 deaths, there would be approximately a 73% increase when we compare 2020's deaths to 2023. And this is where we're gonna transition into what I wanna talk about when it comes to accessing recovery services that are bed-based. Now there are four types of bed-based facilities that function in our province. There are licensed, which often op usually offer a higher intensity care where people are able to access medical care, clinical care, and also have accredited staff that function within them. Registered programs may take a little bit more of a harm reduction approach. There are a lot more peer-led programming and group functions, and staff aren't required to be licensed professionals or clinicians. FNHA is funded through the National Native Alcohol and Drug Abuse Program. And then there's private, where some programs can cost an individual somewhere between $12,000 to $50,000 just to access for one to three months. To expand a little bit more, this is the map from the BCCSU about the licensed bed-based addiction services across the province. You can see here, there are nine within Interior Health that spread from Kamloops to Fort Steele in the east. You've got 
18 and 15 in Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health. And then you also have three on Vancouver Island. Now, to highlight that, there are none in Northern Health Authority that are licensed that have wraparound medical care and access to the level of clinicians and professionals that are able to support people. These sorts of organizations that we talked about in, in the license part are I Recover, Last Door, Phoenix Society, and Turning Point. The registered programs are here. You can see are a lot more populated within the lower mainland, but they do have um, services up towards Prince Rupert, Prince George, and a lot more scattered across the interior and the island. These organizations and registered facilities you may know as Joshua House, Freedom's Door, Together We Can, where there are lower barriers, less services, but take more of a harm redu reduction approach again. This map here is from FNHA, and there are the registered programs for Indigenous peoples across the province. Some of these programs in the north um, are able to do uh, some outreach programs outside of their bed-based locations, um, but that's dependent on their capacity and the requests of the community that's asking outreach. One of the things that I'd like to point out about this map is that FNHA services don't really exist in the Vancouver area. The one service that you do see in Agassiz is a day bed program, which expects individuals participating in it to be able to drive in and out throughout their time there. The reason why I bring this up is because the city of Vancouver is the third most populated region of urban indigenous peoples in Canada behind Winnipeg and Edmonton. Despite indigenous peoples making 2.2% of the city of Vancouver's population, there are approximately 30 to 40% of indigenous peoples that live on the downtown east side. And that means that with that density, there is no indigenous based services that are easily accessible to them without having to jump through all of the hoops that FNHA requires for them to access other treatments outside of their, their, their local area. To delve a little bit more into the research, um, these FNH pro FNHA programs are, are trying to integrate a lot of the local Indigenous cultures and land-based healings um, into the way that the things run. So this literature review here, conducted in 2019 by Hotitsida, which is a research center for health and health research in the Northwest Territories, defines land-based healing as a healing or health program that takes place in a non-urban or rural location that is intentionally cultivated and spiritually, um, spiritually cultivated to ensure that the land is honored and respected, that the land is an active host and a partner for people to engage with in the healing process. The cultivation of the land base is usually done through developing a relationship through spirit-based ceremonies, offerings, and expressions of gratitude and requests for the healing process of the land to, to bless them with. The objective of this literature review was to capture the greatest breadth and the greatest depth of any sort of written knowledge, regardless of the documentation. This scoping review looked through 2,200 titles and tries to add to the very little amount of Indigenous literature when it comes to healing is to the database. 44 of those titles that they had sifted through actually fell into the criteria that they were talking in regards to land-based healing. So their criteria when they looked through all of those titles was something around land-based healing the terms synonymous with recovery, mental wellness promotion, or other sorts of ideas when it comes to Canadian healthcare. It had to be written in English.
these land-based healing programs that they did find within those the, the, the very limited literature that they were able to um, assess was that there are three main things, indigenous healing practices, recognition that the land is necessary for personal and intergenerational healing, and that health and wellness teachings are connected to the land. Wu et al. This article here was shared in May of 2023. It highlights and revisits the current oppression that Indigenous peoples are facing when it comes to ac accessing healthcare and recognizes that this is exacerbated by the according social determinants of health that Indigenous peoples face and also talks about, excuse excuse me, the multitude of barriers when trying to access healthcare. These authors really emphasized the calls to action 20 and 22 that I shared at the very beginning of this presentation. And they also talk about two-eyed seeing, which is something that I'll talk throughout in the next few slides, where we can see there are strengths to both worldviews of indigenous ways of knowing and strengths, and Western, so that they'd be able to walk together and address some of these actions to find some sort of middle ground to be able to help Indigenous peoples. So some of the things that need to be considered um, when it comes to talking about uh, integrating Indigenous culture uh, into these programs was the commitment to communities, actively inviting them encouraging them and giving them self-determination and continuity of care beyond the program. Because it is the definition of a village, a, a village raises each other. Like it takes a, a village to raise a child, but in a way that a village supports each other. Culture is healing. This is where we talk about being able to do ceremonies, to involve elders, to provide workshops where people are able to learn about their culture and their traditions and how they've been passed down, because that is where a lot of the respect comes in for where our knowledge comes from. People versus practitioner focused. This is where we talk about how people need to be at the center of how recovery programs function and are what we call in healthcare right now, patient-centered care rather than how the practitioner wants to execute their best evidence-based um, program. Community-oriented versus individual-oriented. This is a step further from what I just shared, saying that you develop around the community and how to help people around them, not just the individual who is struggling with something. And also attempting to dismantle the colonial power dynamics. And this is how, historically, programs have run in terms of the language and the concepts that are provided throughout uh, a program where there's a lot of jargon or theory or Western ways of, of learning. There's also culturally unsafe practitioners or the way that funding is done where a lot of the funds that are provided do not have flexibility for discretionary spending and require a certain template. And lastly, they talk about holistic healing, which is personalized, strength-based, where clients are able to determine their own goals and not have to try and fit into a practitioner's agenda. This is aligned with harm reduction and many other programs that are incorporated so that we can try and focus on multiple aspects of healing an individual rather than just trying to focus on one aspect and try to do it as efficiently as possible. This 2020 article by Jennifer Redverse talks about the importance of integrating land from Indigenous practitioners' perspectives. We talk about it in a way that land-based healing offers an alternative and also a 
complementary way to engage in mental health services and approaches rather than just being able to seek out the best evidence-based care and try and fit that into different populations. Uh, sorry, I lost my spot there. Um, this, this paper really emphasizes the importance of bringing people into a setting where they're reminded of their humanity, where they're able to interact with the environment and, and see how they're connected to all the living things around them. Because sometimes with the way that society has been set up, you lose how all of the things in life is when you're in a big city and feel like there's no connection to you. And so being able to bring people to remember who they are, they have a place and, and get the illusion or get away from the illusion that the, the quick fix society has taught us. And remember that land-based healing, you can become your own self by connecting to yourself and your culture and, and the community. One thing that I did enjoy um, in, in a part of this article is that it lightly poked fun of the way that academia, healthcare, corporate, empirical literature talks about because um, when asked about one of the uh, practitioners, they said, well, I guess that we can call this experience a program just so that we can get this on paper. And I guess the program is just called life, which further talks about my point about how different indigenous and Western ways of learning and knowing is. So this is a con uh, continuing from that article where there are a lot of common elements within the program um, that found meaning to be impactful in, in supporting land-based healing. So the first one would be flexible programming and structure, allowing the community to be able to have some say in the way that things are going to look when, when trying to achieve a goal. It's community driven and directed by a community protocol. So there is an agreed upon sense of what is happening, but it's all dependent on being able to support one another. It also talks about intergenerational concepts. And if you have time to talk and interested to, to read up on the seven fires, it talks about how different generations touch each other. We're talking about the led by skilled resource people and elders, the quality of land location and relationship, depending on where the program is and, and how that program plays in the cultural perspective, and also addressing all levels of safety. Now, in order to rediscover and reestablish a fund fundamental relationship with our land, you must first experience it directly through practicing cultural activities, trying to engage in language and return the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual aspects back into life. Three of the sub themes that did come up when it talks about land-based healing is talking about innate healing ability of the land itself. And there's a parallel between the land and humans is because they always seek to be able to persist and, and provide some resilience. Um, the second piece is the importance of traditional heal healing and spirituality. So again, trying to integrate what it is like to be indigenous. What did that mean for your parent, your grandparent, and how that continues to keep you connected even to the people who have not been born yet. And also, thirdly, combining that Western therapeutic approach. In 2016, uh, this article was published about the Carrier Sakani Nation and their family services, which is probably, if I'm not mistaken, one of BC's oldest Indigenous-led um, recovery services uh, that's been around. It, it formed because of 11 bands in the late 1990s were concerned about the level of 
of substance use and suicide that were happening in their communities. And they wanted a process of healing to be rooted in indigenous culture. They realized that mainstream addiction treatments had success, limited success, but they also wanted to integrate how to get people back to the land, to the culture, to try and find both ways of healing. And this is what I keep gently mentioning is two-eyed seeing. Learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, while also looking through another eye with the strengths of Western knowledge and ways of knowing. And being able to use these knowledge to work together, benefit everyone. Now, I recognize that this is a little bit of a busy uh, image, but this is what the article shares when it comes to talk about some of the common um, cultural interventions that this program runs. And because this is on the carrier nation, uh, it is seasonally inspired where there is fishing, hunting, gathering berries and natural medicines, or trying to provide um, food for the community surrounding with smoking meats and, and canning them, gathering wood for fire. Also, creating crafts like drums and rattles and dream catchers and really immersing themselves within ceremony, sweat lodges, and commonly, he commonly held uh, within the program. It's important to note that there's no erasure of mainstream clinical interventions. They're trying to find a way where the immersion of both within the program have a very beautiful intersection where we can provide education, but also provide meaning and in, in spirituality to the point of being able to walk both, both worlds. Within this, there are 12 guiding principles that are shared within the land-based healing of the Karish Sakani. One being the spirit, where all of these protocols and ceremonies have where there is a spirit in all things. That the circle reminds us of something that is, is everywhere. It reminds us that we are a part of a whole where there is a beginning and there is an end. The day follows the night, the winter follows the spring in a never ending circle. That there is harmony and balance where the world is constantly changing, but always works towards harmony and balance with the resilience that everything has. All my relations, we're all connected to things, people, plants, trees, rocks. And that the path of life is a continuum, is a journey where we first learn to crawl, then run. We grow up to figure out what our purpose in life is and how we can contribute to those around us. Uh, the Earth connection. We're all relatives because we're all a part of Mother Earth. And language being the most expressive way of communicating the spirit, the emotions, the mental, the thinking, and the behaviors. This is the true and most expressive means for transmission of the original way of being in the world. This article here, Marshall et al., um, published in 2022. It was a very interesting way of trying to integrate two-eyed seeing into the approach of Indigenous supports. And it takes the empirical supported um, perspective of seeking safety, which is something that is treatment for patients who have experienced trauma and also struggle with some sort of substance use disorder. But as, as the authors of, of this publication really delved into the methodology of it all, it overlapped a lot with Indigenous methods because some of the Indigenous values and, and principles are, are honesty, taking care of another, taking care of self, compassion, healthy relationships. And with this, they realized that this could be the perfect grounds for being able to develop a two-eyed seeing model. 
So to go a little bit more into detail about two-eyed seeing, it's an approach that was developed in 2000, or developed or coined in 2004 by Elder Albert Marshall of the Mi'kmaq Nation in Nova Scotia when he believed that there could be a way of decolonizing methodology that could be inclusive of different areas and perspectives of philosophy, theory, and methodology. So with this article, they talked about Indigenous healing and seeking safety and had transformed this program from an absent space with some success with just providing seeking safety as a theory of providing recovery. When they got to know a little bit more about how these two overlapped, this is the diagram that they were able to come up with. And as you can see, it, as you study the medicine wheel here, you can see that there are aspects of seeking safety within these areas of life. So in the East, which is yellow, we have the spiritual, the red is South for emotional, black is West for physical, and North is white for mental. And within this program, they did a lot of cultural ceremonies, such as the sacred fire and sweat lodges, which was identified to help individuals find their identity, to help their connection to, to self, to community, with cultures. And they also had opportunities outside of these ceremonies and these cultural events and experiences where they provided some educational components of seeking safety. And this program found that the key to a lot of success within their time of being able to provide this, that culture was at the center of it, it is important to explore from this research to see how much further we can take this in the world of academia and try and implement this across more communities in need of these supports. This article here by Rowan and all um, integrates talking about 2IT. And as you can kind of get by this point, you can see that culture, two-eyed seeing, land-based are all just weaving back and forth. This is not intended to validate a general library of knowledge and say that it is different than others, but it also tries to establish an understanding that an advocation, things that Indigenous people have tried to do throughout time of colonization, just to say that these two worlds can be exist. These worldviews are allowed to remain autonomous. They're allowed to be present with one another without any sort of domination or assimilation. Now, indigenous knowledge is derived from traditional teachings. It's, uh, it's empirically observed and it's conveyed through stories through metaphoric languages where Western academic knowledge is the social and health sciences, where it's talking about positivist methods, where there's privileged objective, linear hierarchical and written evidence. So there is room and programming doesn't need to be consistent with public health approaches in indigenous cultures because there is no single treatment approach for every single individual. That effective treatment is attending to multiple needs for the client, not just their addictive behavior or their addiction. So my last article that I, I want to share with you as I, I start to wrap things up here is this one here of um, promoting Indigenous culture Response, responsivity in addiction treatment work and trying to take a different theory um, and that is neuro decolonization. And this is by, this, this perspective is held by Jolie Saskamoose and talks about how 
decolonized roadmap to reconciling the failure of conventional health systems and do not offer reliable indigenous healthcare services. So how do we blend treatment understanding with culturally responsive services? Like providers can collaborate with users to create a clear service offering that meet their unique cultural needs. So some of the things that they really talked about in terms of how this, this um, theory would be able to work is that there need to be four protective factors, community engagement, strength-based, trauma-sensitive, and spiritually grounded. And it positions itself to promote the restoration of indigenous community-based health, creates a middle ground for collaboration in the indigenous and Western structures to decolonize health research and uphold commitment to reconciliation and also to guide that research to improve health and well-being. And because this was in Saskatchewan, they say that it's to provide, uh, to, to guide research for peoples of Saskatchewan and beyond. So two-eyed seeing encourages professionals to look at both ways and be able to also extrapolate and comprehend the dynamic, historical, and cultural dimensions of addiction. Now, when we talk about this, I want to define decolonization because I feel like it's a word that is, is starting to get more and more frequently used when it comes to talking about Indigenous care. And what, what I'm trying to say in terms of decolonization, and I hope that this definition can, can speak to you, is that it's to free, whether it's an institution, a fear activity, or a community, from the culture or social effects of colonization or to eliminate colonial influences or attitudes from it. So Saskimus and, and Laville here talk about neuro-decolonization and kind of term that as indigenous peoples overcoming negative feelings that are created by the structural oppression maintained through colonialism. These unsettling colonial tropes with cognitive thinking and replace them with other ways of knowing that try and correct the cognitive biases that they've established from current Western created mindlessness. Decolonization in the indigenous sense is not about self-improvement, but about envisioning futures where we currently don't have the language for it. And so land-based practices and the idea of bringing people to places that they're able to integrate the other aspects of their lives outside of what healthcare is trying to prescribe is one of the best ways to help restoration of the reflection and connectedness to self, community, and others. So to take a closer look and, and bring this all back around, here is the FNHA services that are available in the province. You can see that there are three that are specifically for families, two for couples. Four of them are men's programs. Three of them are women's. And two of them are specific to youth. And one of them, as you can see um, by the specified check mark there, is specifically for females. Now, these programs do a lot of really good things in terms of trying to integrate the indigenous cultures that are available to those locations. But there are also a lot of barriers to try and access those. And this is where I hope to talk about how this is relevant to social work practice. Some of the things that come up when trying to refer patients, individuals to these programs is that sometimes their oat is not accepting of what it is they're they're trying to enter recovery in. Um, and I, I experienced this uh, at my time at St. Paul's where a patient was on Cadian and that was not one of the prescribed oats that they were able to, to go into the program with. Some of these programs are only seasonal. 
the carrier Sakani ones are only for four to six to eight months of the year and maybe provide shorter term outreach in, in the winters and fall. As I said, being in Vancouver with no bed-based recovery centers, there's a lot of distance to cover if you're trying to be referred to, to certain communities to be able to access these. Another one is needing supports from a counselor or a case manager. And just the, the intenseness of needing someone to apply for you and to be able to organize everything is just undermining their ability of self-determination and being able to, to access their own recovery. Some of them, like Round Lake, have long periods of abstinence. Most of them, as you can see on the table, will show that there are a couple weeks. But for, again, my time at uh, St. Paul's, I found out that they actually require five months of sobriety from crystal meth at Round Lake. And that's not something evidence-based, uh, evidence but it's something within their local policies that is a barrier for people to access it when they are ready. And lastly, there are specific demographics in these programs. It's wonderful that there are 10 across the province, but some of them are only for families with a child. Some of them are only for couples. And quite frankly, it's, it's hurtful that in the applications, if you're trans, binary, or two-spirited, you don't have the opportunity to find a program that fits for you. You have to select a gendered program that you would feel safest in. Lastly, to kind of emphasize the importance of this, the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People actually received royal assent in Canada on June 21st in 2021. And this outlines the minimum standard for Indigenous peoples with survival, dignity, and well-being. In Article 24, it talks about Indigenous peoples' right to their traditional medicines to maintain their health practices. It allows them equal rights, the enjoyment of the highest attainable physical mental health standards. This being passed really speaks to how much more work we need to do in terms of being able to find a way of being between Indigenous ways of knowing and healing and being able to provide them our tools from a Western academic healthcare lens so that we can be able to support decolonization and, and healing and the reconciliation that is, is direly in need. So some of the things that I'd love for social workers and, and other healthcare allies to think about in terms of what this means for your practice or how you walk through healthcare is to continue strengthening your relationships with indigenous community resources or indigenous peoples, because a lot of these people have wealths of knowledge that they're willing to share. And working with them can be able to provide you more opportunities to, to navigate what it is that is at your disposal. Collaborate with people's identified community of care. When working with Indigenous peoples, work with them, work with their communities, their family, their, their support workers, because you can be able to get different perspectives and more support to be able to support you. Advocate for supports and funding and equitable access because we as healthcare workers within the system have a lot more opportunities to look at the discrepancies, the gaps, the cracks, and to be able to call them out for what they are also helps us being an ally without having to outwardly work with Indigenous peoples because this is something that we can change from the inside as well. Critically reflecting on the harms of institutions and how you can mitigate that. And that's also talking from the last point of being able to address some 
the biases that society has provided us from an anti-oppressive lens. Our biases are created because of the way that society has made it. And so think about how institutions can harm, how you can mitigate that, and how you can have open conversations about what to do next. Continue asking questions, whether it be to the patient you're supporting, to the resource that you're accessing, to how you, to, to yourself, on how you can do just a little bit better or differently to support Indigenous patients that you care for. And also to continue pushing for future research, because as I said, these topics discussed today do not have a large basis for um, literature. And as we get more awareness and backing, we can get more funding and be able to strengthen the academic literature because Indigenous peoples in the world of academia and healthcare don't have a larger a large voice to say where funding should go unless we all start becoming that ally that backs them up and say, yeah, this is something that we need to do. And so with that, I really appreciate all of you tuning in. I know that it's a lot to listen to. And I hope that you're going to take one or two things away from this because it is important and is something that we will continuously interact with in our lives day to day. Now, I, I'd love to thank these people, um, Jess and Zan, um, the social work leads at, at the fellowship. Um, they put up with the chaos of me trying to delve through the very limited literature that's here. Um, the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada for sponsoring my fellowship so that I can pursue more education to support this demographic. I'd also love to thank the BCCSU, Shanu and, and Amir for, for constantly helping me out with with just setting this up or sending emails to nudge me because I am very slow at replying and I just really appreciate all of the support and guidance that they've been able to provide. So thank you so much for tuning in. There are some of my references and yeah. Thank you, EJ. Thank you so much for, for that lecture and for all of you for joining as well. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions. I'll give people a minute to put any questions in the, the box there. Um, in the meantime, I, I really loved how you started by talking about some of the progress and um, things that are going on that are, are, are positive in the news articles. And I'm wondering if, if you can comment on like in the next five to 10 years where you would like to see services and service delivery for um, Aboriginal and Indigenous populations. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I I really hope that there is going to be a lot more widespread access, because I mean, knowing that there are only ten across the province, and each service only has approximately 10, 15, 20 beds, uh, that that doesn't give a lot. And so I know that there are developments in in Northern Health and um, in the interiors and the Kootenays, but I would love for, for people to advocate for more services and, and not just like widespread throughout the province, but being able to address where a lot more of the, the density is. So um, yeah, I, I just, more widespread access is, is my answer to that. And maybe access in Vancouver too, like you had mentioned yeah. throughout the talk, yeah. And I guess just speaking to kind of the last slide and avenues for further research, like if you were given funding to conduct a research study, like what, what would you, based on looking at the whole body of, of literature that you presented on, like, where would you do it, a research? Um, like, where would you, what, what, what would you conduct as a, to contribute to further research? What, what would you look at? It's it's tricky because I, I feel as though with all of the academic articles that are published, we can't have a broad stroke brush on the the differences or similarities between um, in indigenous nations and how they are um, between each other. So 
being able to put that back into community, whether it's through FNHA or local First Nation governments, uh, to be able to drive their own way of researching health or being able to contribute to that literature base, um, that that I, I can't answer that question because it's just so relationship based, and and that's just the way that Indigenous people are is just community and relationships. And I can't give a an exact answer of how I'd use that funding, but to to be able to provide more empowerment and encouragement to individual communities and how we can allow that to be a centerpiece for um, the surrounding communities that are there. Let's see if, see a few comments over here. So what we might want to, what we might want to do, San, is just commit to um, ensuring that EJ has all of the questions and comments and we will have him follow up with anybody who's submitted any questions. I know it's one o'clock now. Sounds like a plan. Just a few comments on the side, but we can get those to you, EJ. Thank you again, everybody, for attending. Thank you.